The Savior replied, the one you saw on the tree, joyful and laughing, is the living Savior. However, the one into whose hands and feet the nails are driven represent his physical body, the substitute who endures shame resembling him, but look upon him and me. And now that I have your attention, welcome to my channel. My name is Joshua T. Whaley. If you are a first time viewer, this channel is dedicated to the author and translator reading his own words instead of that of an AI voice reading someone else's along with AI generated imagery. If this intrigues you, please stick around. I would also like to thank all my new subscribers. Our community is growing. And if you are a returning viewer, you may recognize that the camera angle is changed. Even a 140 pound vegetarian who prides himself on being level-headed can throw a GoPro against the wall after your third take when the GoPro overheats and you're 17 minutes into the video. Three times. Three times that happened. Anyway, let's jump into today's text. The Apocalypse of Peter, also known as the Revelation of Peter, is an apocryphal text written sometime between 100 and 150 CE by an unknown author claiming to be the Apostle Peter. It is heavily influenced by both Jewish apocryphal literature and Hellenistic Greek philosophy. The text is a vision had by Peter after the crucifixion and resurrection of Yeshua, where the Savior explains the signs before his second coming, followed by visions of heaven and hell. Even though this work is not included in the New Testament, it is classified as an accepted New Testament apocrypha, and in the second century was a part of the approved reading list of the growing Christian movement. The Apocalypse of Peter also heavily influenced later Christian works from the second century on through the fourth, including Dante's Divine Comedy. With that said, even though this is considered part of the New Testament apocrypha, there are many Gnostic philosophies found throughout the text. For my interpretation of this intriguing text, I will be using the translation made by James Brashler and Roger A. Bullard, which is included in the Nag Hammadi Library. With that said, let's begin with my interpretation. As the Savior was seated in the temple, in the 300th year of the covenant and the agreement of the 10th pillar, feeling content with the count of the living, incorruptible majesty, he addressed me, saying, Peter, blessed are those who belong to the Father, who revealed life to those who originated from life through me. For I have reminded those built upon what is firm, so they may hear my word and recognize words of unrighteousness and law transgression as distinct from righteousness, coming from the height of every word of this pleroma of truth, having been illuminated and good pleasure by he who the principalities sought. However, they did not find him, nor was he mentioned in any generation of the prophets. This is intriguing. This is definitely Gnostic philosophy. It's claimed that Yeshua just said that the leaders and the prophets of the Old Testament were wrong with who they believed was God or the Living Father. Let's continue. He has now appeared among these and the one who manifest, who is the Son of Man, exalted above the heavens and reverence of men of similar essence. But you, Peter, must strive to be perfect in line with your name alongside me, the one who chose you, because from you I have established a foundation for the remnant who I have called to knowledge. Therefore, be strong until your ultimate righteousness of him who summoned you, having invited you to know him in a manner worthy of doing due to the rejection he faced and the sinews of his hands and feet, that's the thick skin, and the crowning by those of the middle region, and the body of his radiance, which they bring in hope and service for a reward of honor, as he was about to admonish you three times this night. Now this will be Peter's thoughts. 
While he was expressing these things, I noticed the priests and crowds rushing towards us with stones as though they intended to kill us. I was terrified that we were about to die. He said to me, Peter, I have often told you that you are blind and have no guide. If you seek to understand their blindness, place your hands over your eyes, your robe, and declare what you see. When I did so, I could see nothing. I exclaimed, no one perceives in this manner. He instructed me again, do it once more. A sense of fear mingled with joy emerged within me, for I beheld a new light surpassing the brightness of day. Then it descended upon the Savior. I relayed to him what I had witnessed. He replied, raise your hands and listen to what the priests and the crowds are declaring. I heard the priests seated with the scribes, and the masses were raising their voices in praise. After hearing this from me, he said, heighten your ears and take note of what they are expressing. After I listened once more and heard, as you sit, they are exalting you. When I expressed these ideas, the Savior replied, I have already informed you that these individuals are blind and deaf. Therefore, pay attention to the message they are sharing with you in a concealed manner and protect them. Do not disclose them to the people of these ages. They will slander you in these times because they are unaware of you, yet they will commend you for your knowledge. Initially, many will embrace our teaching. However, they will eventually stray from them following the will of the Father of their misguided beliefs, as they have done what he desired. He will reveal them in his judgment, meaning the servants of the word. Those who become entangled with these individuals will be imprisoned, and they will lack understanding. The innocent, good, and pure ones they compel will fall into the hands of the bringer of death, and into the realm of those who honor Christ in a revival. They will laud the propagators of falsehood, those who will come after you. They will hold tightly to the name of the deceased figure, believing they will achieve purity. However, they will become significantly tainted and will descend into a name of error falling under the influence of a sly, crafty man and a diverse doctrine, and they will govern without law. Some among them will revile the truth and propagate corrupt teachings. They will speak ill of one another. Certain individuals will be identified, those who stand firm in the authority of the archons of a man and a highly tormented naked woman. Those who articulate these ideas will inquire about dreams if they claim that a dream originates from a demon aligned with their errors, they will receive destruction instead of immortality. Good fruit cannot come from evil. Each being produced what is akin to itself. Not every soul embodies truth or immortality. Every soul from these ages is destined for death in our perspective because it remains a slave, having been created for its desires and their ultimate ruin in which they exist and from which they derive. Side note, again, this is Gnostic Philosophy 101. He's talking about the Demiurge. They cherish the material beings that emerge alongside them, but the eternal souls are different from these, Peter. Indeed, while the time has not yet arrived, the eternal soul will appear similar to a mortal one. However, it will not disclose its true nature, which is that it alone is eternal, contemplating immortality, harboring faith, and yearning to renounce these aspects. Wise individuals do not gather figs from thorn bushes or grapes from thistles. On the one hand, that which is 
perpetually changing is found within that which it originates form, emerging from what is not good, ultimately leading to its destruction and demise. Conversely, what comes into being through the Eternal One exists within the essence of life and immortality to which they bear resemblance. Thus, everything that does not exist will dissolve into non-existence. Deaf and blind beings only associate with their kind. Others, however, may transform from misleading words and deceptive mysteries. Some who lack understanding of the mysteries discussed matters they do not grasp. Yet they will claim that the secret of truth belongs solely to them. In their arrogance, they will reach for pride, envying the eternal soul that has become a testament. Every authority, rule, and power of the aeons desires to unite with these in the creation of the world, said those who do not exist, forgotten by those who do, might offer praise despite being neither saved nor guided towards the way by them, always hoping to achieve imperishability. If the eternal soul gains authority in an intellectual spirit, they will immediately ally with one of those who misleads them. Many others who stand against the truth and act as messengers of falsehood will establish their own errors and laws to oppose my pure thoughts, perceiving that good and evil stem from a single source. They exploit my words to conduct their business and will propagate dire fates. The lineage of eternal souls will wander in vain until my arrival. They will emerge from them receiving my forgiveness for their transgressions, which they fell into due to their adversaries, for whom I attained their ransom from bondage to bestow freedom, so they may create a counterfeit remnant in the name of the deceased person, Hermes, the firstborn of unrighteousness, in order to obscure the light that exists from the innocent. Side note, two points. It almost sounds like Yeshua is saying that in the end, he will forgive everybody. When he said he obtained the ransom for their bondage to bestow freedom. Is that just me? Second, Hermas. I'm wondering if that's the name uh, that comes from the book, The Shepherd of Hermas, which was almost the final book of the Bible. There was a contentious vote in the Council of Nicaea to have that as the final book and not the Revelation of John. However, The Shepherd is a much longer text, and it didn't go along the lines of keeping the masses scared. All right, let's continue. Such individuals are the laborers destined to be cast into the outer darkness away from the children of light, for they will neither enter nor allow those seeking approval from their liberation. And others who endure hardship believe they can refine the wisdom of the true brotherhood, which is the spirit bond of those united in fellowship, revealing the union of incorruptibility. The related group of the sisterhood will merely serve as a facade. These individuals are the ones who oppress their brethren, proclaiming, by this our God shows mercy as salvation flows to us through this, unaware of the consequences that await those who take joy in the suffering of the innocent they behold, and whom they have held captive. There will also be some among those outside our number who call themselves bishops and deacons as if they have been granted authority from God. They will submit themselves to the judgment of the leaders. Such people are barren paths. I think he's talking about the Pharisees. 
I responded. I expressed fear over what you shared, that indeed the little ones are perceived as the imposters and that many will mislead countless living souls, causing their destruction among themselves. And when they invoke your name, they will be trusted? The Savior replied, for a predetermined time based on their error, there will they will govern the little ones. Once their error has run its course, the internal essence of immortal wisdom will regain its youth and the little ones will take authority over those who are their rulers. He will uproot the source of their errors and expose its arrogance so that its sham will be evident to all. And such individuals will become unchangeable. Therefore, let us proceed with fulfilling the will of the incorruptible Father, for behold, the one who bring them judgment are approaching, and they will expose their shame. But they cannot harm me, and you, Peter, will be in their midst. Do not let your fear of cowardice deter you. Their thoughts shall be blinded, for the unseen one stands against them. When he spoke these words, I perceived him as being overtaken by the emotions evoked. I asked, What do I see, O Lord? Is it you who they are seizing, and are you catching hold of me? Or is this another person, joyful and laughing on the tree? And is it some other figure whose hands and feet are being struck? The Savior replied, The one you saw on the tree, joyful and laughing, is the living Savior. However, the one into whose hands and feet the nails are driven represents his physical body, the substitute who endures shame, resembling him, but look upon him and me. Yet I, looking upon, said, Lord, no one is paying attention to you. Let's escape this place. He responded, I have instructed you, leave the blind alone. And you see how they do not comprehend what they utter, for the son of the glory has been shamed in place of my servant. I noticed something approaching us, resembling the one who laughed on the tree. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, the Savior. A vast and undescribable light surrounded them with countless invisible angels praising them. When I gazed at him, the one offering praise was unveiled. He said to me, Be strong, for you are the one entrusted with these mysteries, destined to understand them through revelation, that the one they crucified is the first born, the abode of demons, and the hard vessel they inhabit of Elohim, of the cross which lies beneath the law. But the one who stands beside him is the living Savior, the foremost in him, who was seized and then released, joyfully looking at those who did harm while they are at odds with one another. Thus, he laughs at their lack of insight, aware that they are born blind. Therefore, the one vulnerable to suffering will come since the body acts as the substitute. What they release was my incorporeal body, and I am the intellectual spirit filled with radiant light. The one you saw approaching me is our intellectual pleroma, which harmonizes the perfect light with my Holy Spirit. Therefore, what you witness should be shared with those from a different lineage who are not from this error. For there will be no respect for anyone who is mortal, but rather for those selected from an everlasting essence, which has proven capable of holding the one who provides abundancy. Hence, I stated to everyone who possesses 
more will be given, and they will have more than enough. However, the one who lacks, that is, the individual of this realm, who is entirely lifeless, detached from the cultivation of the origin of all that is produced, if one who embodies the immortal nature comes forth, they believe they possess him, it will be taken away from them and given to the one who truly embodies it. So be brave and do not be afraid at all, for I will stand by you so that none of your foes can triumph over you. Peace be with you. Be strong. After the Savior spoke these words, Peter regained his senses. You know what I forgot? I forgot the, oops, excuse me, point when I misread one of my own words. Anyway, let's unpack this. There was so much in there. There was the Gnostic philosophy that we covered, terms like the Aeons and the Archons. There was a reference to the Demiurge, um, questioning the Pharisees and who they claimed their God was. It, it was an amazing text. So I can understand why the original church added it, but then it was taken out when the Romans decided to set up a different narrative. But as far as going too deep into the text, I'll leave the judgment of what you interpret some of the expressions found throughout the work up to yourselves, because that is the one thing, is that we all interpret what we see and hear differently. And I'm not here to make you think what I think. I'm only here to give you what was written and allow you to make your own judgment on it. Anyway, after that ramble that was almost incoherent as a politician, I want to thank you if you stuck around. You know how YouTube works. If you like what I'm doing, you can like and subscribe. If you really want to help support me, you can find my books at Barnes & Noble or on Amazon. There's links down below. Anyway, I'll talk to you again soon. Love you all. Bye.